guys. You know that guy that makes the weird blending Pokemon videos? Anyway, I am going to be showing you how to do a 3D scan using Meshroom. So I'm going to be assuming that you already have Meshroom installed, and uh, after that I'm going to take you through the quick steps that it is basically just to take a 3D scan. Most of it's just about slow walking around something and then letting Meshroom select all the frames and stuff for you. So the first thing that you want to do is you want to click and drag whatever your video file is into this area here, your drop image files and folders. And this little thing will pop up, which is a keyframe selection. Uh, ignore the two, it's just because I accidentally duplicated it. Uh, then what you want to go down to... Oh, uh, whoop. Stop computation on that. Is we want to go down to uh, PNG and select PNG. Don't worry about that. what I just did this then. I was trying to run this beforehand to try and get ahead of it. Then what we want to do is we want to hit right click and press compute. So now what it's going to be doing is it's going to be creating a file inside wherever your uh, Meshroom file is saved. It's going to be grabbing the video that you had inputted, so the, click, the one you just clicked and dragged into the drop files and folders. And it's now going to be selecting everything that's useful inside the file. So inside of a video there is a lot of frames that don't need to be there. It's going to shorten like I don't know, just say you had a 45 second video down to 45 frames that you need. So it's going to be able to tell you what frames are actually useful and which ones aren't. Because if you were to use too many frames, it would take literally days to compute instead of a few hours, if not, what, an hour. So this is one of the most important things to get on too quick. Um, uh, so the next thing you have to look at is you've got your 3D viewport. It's a bit annoying to handle this one, especially as someone like me who uses Splendor mostly. Um, but yeah, so you've got your click and drag to move around, your shift click to move where the gimbal is, where your uh, camera is rotating off. Um, and yeah, so we'll be using this just to preview how our, uh, what's it called, um, points and stuff work in the scene. So I won't be able to, like, you know, preview the, the mesh or whatever in here, because we'll be moving it straight into Blender, and we'll be previewing it inside there. But that's alright. So, we're going to let this compute, and we'll come back. So the first part's done, so we've got our keyframes selected, uh, and they all, like the computer's already run through and figured out what are the most useful frames. So, what we can do now is we need to find where the files were saved, so we're going to go back into our computer and go to, um, so we've got to save this document, wheel 2, meshroom cache, keyframe selection, and pick the one with the files in it. So. These are all of its selected frames. So as you can tell, there is a good few of them, but compared to how many frames that we actually had, you know, this is minute. So it just shows that while, you know, there's a lot of data that can be processed, it's much better if the data is cleaner and higher quality than lots and lots of data. So otherwise your computer is going to be having a really hard time trying to figure out what's going on. So what we're going to do now is we're just going to select the first one and the last one, pressing shift to select all, you can drag in, copy it, it's going to load them all in. Now, all these little connections and stuff here mean that once you hit the start up here, it's just going to run through all the major actions, but for the sake of just showing how this stuff works, I'm actually just going to be right clicking and using compute instead. That's just how you figure it, you know, that's how you want to like select a certain thing and just to process a certain part of it rather than just pressing start, which will start from the start and process all the way through. So, key selection's done. First thing we want to do is we want to do camera initialization. So press compute, it's already done. Feature extraction, compute. It will take a little bit longer than other ones, but now here's a really good thing you can do. If you click on your task manager, it will show you the progress through here. So it will show, so show what st uh, state it's running in, show the chunks, and obviously it's being executed locally because I'm pretty sure this can be done in the cloud as well. So we've only got two chunks to do, so this should be fairly quick. So the first chunk is done. Uh, well, actually, no, both chunks, sorry. So your, your two chunks are done. Now we can go into image matching. So right click and compute, and see how long that takes. It's already done. So this only took about a minute and 34. This is due to the fact that our uh, image base is so small. Hit for feature matching. Now this might take a while because what it's doing is it's practically just comparing every single photo and uh, trying to basically 
match them to each other from different angles, and which is how it's able to figure out what it looks like in 3D space. So I'm going to let that take its time, and we should be good. To matching done, next is structure from motion, click compute. Yep, and this is this is the part where it uses the data from the feature matching to try and figure out, you know, what it looks like. Uh, and now, once that is finished computing, you'll actually see points appear, and make sure that this is set to show, so lit up, that's what it looks like when it's hidden, and then you'll see all your points appear in 3D space. Okay. So we're done. Uh, now, I selected a little button down here saying display features. Um, I'm going to turn that off now. But now you will have a scene here that's got all of your little points. So if you want to make the scene a bit more manageable to view, what you can do is you can go into display and then you can turn your point size down. So if you turn it down, it's really easy to see what it looks like. So you can see that you even get detail of like the tread. You even get detail of that coat can somehow. It's, you know, it's a pretty damn good scan, and there's quite a lot of points on the ground here, but that's just that's just because it was managed to be caught in most pictures. So that's alright. It, it shouldn't become too much of a problem, though it will be scanned. This next part, I'm just going to press on the right click for, uh, on the thing for compute, and then what I'm going to do is just press start, and I'm going to let the rest of this just chunk its way through. We have the main data that's most important, um, and also on that, all these little things here are every single perspective of where the pictures were taken from. So every picture was taken from one of these cameras. And since there's only 46 of them, that's actually not that much data to work with. But you will get a surprisingly good result despite that. So I'm going to let this do its thing, and we'll be back. So we're up to the meshing step now, but you won't be able to actually see the mesh in the viewport without re-importing back in. So yeah, it will be yellow, and this will take quite a while. The meshing step's typically not that quick. But what we'll be doing is we'll be pulling the file out textured as a wavefront OBJ, and then we'll be bringing it into Blender. So I'll we'll give you back if that happens. So we're back. Texturing's done. Mesh filtering's done. Meshing's done. So we now actually have the file. But as you can see, we can't actually see it in here, nor if we try and click between the sol uh, solid, wireframe, textured mode in here. But no, that's all good. So what we're going to do now is we're going to go into where that file was saved. So, boink, boink. And you'll have this entire set here. So we'll go back to the main file of wheel 2. So this is the one where it's being saved. And what we're going to do is we're going to do texturing, go into here. And you're going to notice that we actually have an OBJ file. So what I'm going to do is start up a fresh Blender file. Yes, you can use whatever the hell you want. But obviously I'm using Blender because it's free. Just like Meshfront. Um, we're going to grab that file, we're going to click and drag it in, or you'll have to use the import, like the regular import mode, but that's dependent. dependent. Import the OBJ, and here we go. So now you've got your entire file. Now, because this is actually being preloaded with textures, you can actually switch it straight to Material Preview and see it. So, as you can see, some data is not saved. That's because I never took a picture of that area, so this is my fault. But, if you look closely at this, that's fantastic. That's really good. You can even see the stone that was stuck in the tread of the tire. Yes, the, the coke can got murdered, but the, the coke can only got murdered because it's actually not in focus. Like, it's not the primary part. You can see the back of the car. You can see this is a Victorian plate, which is pretty funny. Um, yeah, and obviously anything that is not directly in focus will be stretched, UV stretched. So the next thing that we're going to do is we're probably going to do a bit of uh, cleaning up of this file. Because as you can see, if we go down to statistics, we're running a pretty big file. So I'm just going to show some really quick and easy ways of getting this file smaller. So the first thing I'm going to do is press 7, so we get a, a top-down view. And as you can see, 90% of this is not needed. We don't want it. So I'm going to go into wireframe. I'm going to press tab. It's going to scream momentarily because this is a really big file. And I'm going to just delete that. And I'm going to delete by faces. So that's a big portion of it done. Faces. Yes, usually you'd use like one of the circle selects, but it's a little laggier for some reason while doing this. So 
delete faces. And yeah, you might find it difficult to find where the thing is, but yeah. So keep it in wireframe. Going to get rid of all this and try your best not to select the wheel itself. Now I'm going to go into the circle select. So circle select. And I'm just going to, as you can see, it's not that it's not that great. So we're going to raise the radius a bit, holding shift to make sure that you don't um, forget some of the selection. Da -da -da -da. And then we're going to hit delete, and then we'll see what it looks like now. Ah, so now we're going to go back into material uh, preview and leave tab mode. And it's starting to look pretty good. Obviously, it's going to look best from this angle specifically. Because that's where all the pictures were taken. If this wasn't against a car, I could take all sorts of 360 photos around it, and you get much better geometry instead of, you know, the UV stretching and you know the fact that it's munted in some places. But that's all good. So that's a pretty good model, all things considered. So the fir the first thing we want to do is we want to show how you can use this. So of course I'm gonna I'm just gonna use EV. It's a lot quicker. We're gonna hold Z, go up into rendered mode. We have no world light or anything, so I'm going to add a what's it called? Oh, what's it called? Light. Here we are. Light. Point light. This point light's just gonna go wherever your 3D cursor is. But as you can see, it's materially accurate, and the lights work perfectly on it. Obviously, you can't do that with the picture. So this is the reason why we use photogrammetry is because you can get lighting effects and stuff to happen in an area. Lucky EV is great looking. So the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to set up some cameras to make this look good. So I'm going to set the origin to geometry just so it's got a center point. I'm going to create a uh, shift S and go to cursor to selected. I'm going to create an empty, just a cube, drag the cube down. I'm going to create a camera. Camera, make the camera a bit small so it's less obnoxious. Press zero. Uh, then what we're going to do is control P, so bind the two of them together, keep transform. Now, if I rotate this, it will go with the camera. So let's just move it to about there. Okay, bring up your timeline, insert. We want to hit rotate, not that. Press insert. Just want to drag it a bit further out so it's a bit slower. Obviously, because you've got EV, you can do live play playback. Yeah, this is probably to what 300 frames. I'm gonna probably just hit uh, rotate, just a little to the right. Insert. 200, and then I'm going to move this back around to here, just so you can see it. Insert, move this to frame 280. So you should just look something like this. Go into your output, let's change it to 30. Looking pretty good. Now what we want to do is basically just move this light around so that we can we can view the the light being changed. So I'm going to go into 7 view for this, insert, frame 100, insert, frame 200, insert, frame, oh, we do what, 260, insert. Let's look what it looks like in the viewport. Show the, the light's interaction with your model. And I don't really like the fact that it's still quite dark here, so I'm going to go on to that, press insert, and just overwrite that keyframe. Awesome. That's good for me. And then we can just render it out. You can see we've got a pretty damn good looking model 
and of course, because it's a 3D model, now you can use lights and a scene and stuff to interact with it. So anyway, thanks for watching, and uh, I'm probably going to make a few more tutorials after this, and uh, let's, let's hope Jason's still watching. Yes, I'm still doing stuff to do with Blender. I'm not entirely just ignoring it. I just haven't had a computer for this entire time, because that laptop, it finally got cooked. It's almost like if you use a computer for seven years straight of constant rendering, you're probably going to cook its already inadequate cooling. So anyway, have a good day. See you guys.